A few weeks ago, a Russian Su-24 fighter bomber was shot down by the Turkish armed forces near the border of Syria. It was the first time a NATO member admitted of shooting down a Russian warplane since the end of the Cold War. What exactly happened is disputed by the Turkish and Russian governments. Both sides have conflicting stories with many disputed technical details. However, what is clear is that a Russian warplane was shot down one way or another. Equally important, the Turkish general staff acknowledged direct responsibility for shooting down the aircraft. But here's the thing. Airspace violations by Russia and Turkey occur on a frequent base. Russia has violated the airspace of a number of NATO members and neighboring states. Turkey has violated the airspace of neighboring Greece, Iraq and Syria. For example, in 2014 alone, Turkey violated the airspace of Greece over the Aegean Sea roughly 2,000 times. The point is, this incident has nothing to do with airspace violations or international law. Regardless of which side is telling the truth, the confrontation between Russia and Turkey is a geopolitical collision that was bound to happen. All it needed was the downing of an aircraft. In this report we will look at the geopolitical aspects of the downing of the aircraft and explain the Turkish-Russian rivalry. Welcome to Caspian Report by me Shirvan. It is said that nations have no long-lasting friends or allies, they only have long-lasting interests. Ankara and Moscow are clashing not because Putin and Erdogan desire it, but because national interests of Turkey and Russia demand it. Both countries are inheritors of historical empires and fought 17 military campaigns over the past five centuries. Nearly all of them were started and won by the Russians. But since the end of the Cold War, the relationship between Moscow and Ankara has been relatively stable. Now this Russian-Turkish balance is returning to its historical roots of conflict and confrontation. The first geopolitical dispute erupted during the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008. This was followed by the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014. The Russian involvement in strategic locations as Georgia and Crimea were a significant blow to the Turkish geopolitics. Yet despite the expanding Russian influence, Ankara did not want a direct confrontation with Moscow. Instead, Turkey preferred to let the United States, Poland and Romania take the lead on the coalition against Russia. After all, this made sense. A geopolitical confrontation against Russia would strain the Turkish economy. The crisis in Ukraine was then followed by the Russian airstrikes in Syria, which dealt a devastating blow to the Turkish efforts to build a pro-Turkish rebel organization that was meant to overthrow the al-Assad government. From the Turkish perspective, the Russian airstrikes in Syria was the final stroke. Just as Russia sees the former Soviet states as its backyard, so too does Turkey see the former Ottoman Sunni states in the Levant as part of the Turkish sphere of influence. Turkey's downing of the Russian fighter jet was a symbolic message to Moscow that Ankara is willing to act on its frustrations with Russia. In a previous Caspian report regarding the Russian airstrikes in Syria, we explained the Russian intentions behind the air campaign. Turkey, however, has different plans. For the last couple of months, Erdogan has been trying to get the Europeans and the Americans on board in enforcing a no-fly zone over Syria. It sounds straightforward, but there are some things we need to explain regarding this plan. If history is any indicator, a no-fly zone without troops on the ground is a massacre waiting to happen. That is what happened in Srebrenica. So this no-fly zone is in reality a safe zone, with the deployment of an estimated 18,000 troops to enforce the protection of civilians. It is estimated that this safe zone would measure roughly 90 by 30 kilometers and would be situated north of Aleppo. 
The PR mission of this safe zone would be to settle the Syrian refugees in their national borders and thereby offer a long-term solution to the refugee crisis. The unofficial mission is to achieve two objectives that are critical to Turkish geopolitics. First, by establishing a physical foothold in northern Syria, Ankara will be able to block the two Kurdish-controlled regions in Syria from joining up and thereby block any attempts to create an autonomous Kurdish state within Syria, thereby keeping a check on Kurdish separatism back in Turkey. The involvement of the Kurdish faction in the Syrian civil war is one of the reasons for Turkey's passive stance against ISIS. Ankara sees ISIS both as a threat as well as a leverage against the Kurds. From the Turkish perspective, the Kurds are a bigger threat than ISIS. So Turkey is not willing to crush ISIS just to see the Kurdish factions gain more territory and fill in the gap of power which would have tremendous consequences for the long-term territorial integrity of Turkey. Second, a foothold in Syria would grant Turkey a greater role in the Syrian domestic affairs and the Syrian negotiations and thus thereby expand the Turkish sphere of influence into Syria. These two objectives are critical to the geopolitics of Turkey. Thus, achieving this goal and gaining control over northern Syria requires supporting the pro-Turkish rebels in Syria to push back ISIS. Once the zone is set up and secured, refugee camps would be established and protected by foreign troops, preferably by Turkish troops. At least, that was the plan. Russia has its own share of interests in Syria. For one, by conducting airstrikes in Syria, Russia improves its international image as a global player. Also, the airstrikes in Syria allow Russia to expand its influence in Iran by keeping Tehran dependent on Moscow. Finally, by involving itself in Syria, Russia improves its leverage in the Syrian negotiations and from there can use Syria in a geopolitical trade for Ukraine. To sum things up, both Russia and Turkey have conflicting interests in the future of Syria. However, the Turkish strategy collapsed the moment the Russians started dropping bombs on the pro-Turkish rebel forces. Moscow's efforts to defend the al-Assad government and the airstrike campaign in Syria deal an enormous blow to Turkish interests. Moreover, the Russian violations of Turkish airspace and its deliberate flight paths near the Turkish border were intended to force Ankara to reconsider its strategy to establish a safe zone in northern Syria. Turkey, however, didn't back down and brought down a Russian warplane as a symbolic message to Russia to stay away from the Turkish objectives near the border of Syria. As we've explained earlier, the geopolitical stakes are high for both countries. Yet despite this, in the words of the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, Russia is not planning to fight with Turkey meaning that a direct military response against Turkey is very unlikely, rather Moscow will seek an asymmetric approach. For example, two weeks ago Putin signed a decree to impose a number of sanctions on Turkey. The two most important of these include a ban on a number of Turkish imports such as foodstuffs, which will go into effect on the 1st January of 2016. This will be in line with the current Russian sanctions against European and American food commodities. However, banning Turkish food would be the least effective form of sanctions. Turkish products would be exported to neighboring Azerbaijan and from there sold to the Russian markets. By using Azerbaijan as a transit state, Turkish products would be sold under an Azerbaijani label. Now, Russian officials understand this perfectly well and in fact that is exactly what they're trying to achieve. By allowing Azerbaijan as a transit for Turkish goods, Russia gives the impression that it is doing something while at the same time Russia prevents a price rise in the local markets. So in short, these sanctions on the Turkish food products are only meant for PR purposes. The second most important sanction is Moscow's decision to use Russian tourism agencies 
to suspend trips to Turkey. Now, tourism accounts for about 12% of the overall Turkish economy. But the roughly 4.5 million Russian tourists who visited Turkey in 2014 represented about 11% of the total number of tourists who visited Turkey. So even though tourism is an important industry for Ankara, the restriction of Russian tourists to Turkey will not make a significant dent in the overall Turkish economy. Russia is planning on additional sanctions against Turkey, but none of them will have any meaningful influence. The only way Russia could hurt Turkey in a non-military way is sanctions on the energy trade. Turkey is the second largest importer of Russian natural gas and a major importer of other Russian resources such as coal, oil, metals, agricultural products, etc. Turkey can find short-term alternative suppliers for most of its Russian imports, but for natural gas, which is an important energy source for Turkish households and industries, there simply is no short-term alternative. About 45% of Turkey's natural gas needs are supplied by Russia. Roughly 27 of the total 50 billion cubic meters is imported from Russia through two pipelines that each can hold 16 billion cubic meters of natural gas. So Russia has the option to cut off Turkey's supplies by two methods. First, Moscow could directly restrict its energy trade with Turkey through the Blue Stream, which runs across the Black Sea. The second option is to restrict the flow of natural gas through the Gas West pipeline, which runs from Ukraine, Romania and Bulgaria to Turkey. However, restricting energy exports to Turkey by this route would involve restricting the energy trade to all the transit countries as well. Doing this would upset all of Eastern Europe and that is not something Russia is willing to risk. So the only feasible way for Russia to use energy trade as a leverage against Turkey is by restricting the flow of natural gas through the Blue Stream gas pipeline. This would cost Turkey about 16 billion cubic meters in natural gas, which is an amount that Turkey is simply not ready to deal with. Furthermore, Moscow has been pushing hard for a deal with Turkey in realizing the Turk Stream, which is a gas pipeline intended to bypass Europe. This project is meant as Moscow's long-term strategy to retain its energy monopoly over Europe. If Russia does decide to restrict energy trade to Turkey, the feasibility of the Turk Stream will be seriously undermined and along with it the future of the Russian natural gas monopoly in Europe. So if the situation requires it, Russia can restrict its natural gas exports to Turkey thereby crippling the Turkish economy, however doing so will have an impact on the Russian markets as well. More importantly, a Russian response this severe will be met with asymmetrical retaliation by Turkey, one that would cut off Russia from the Mediterranean Sea. The 1936 Montreux Convention grants Turkey legal control over the Bosporus Straits and the Dardanelles. This means that whenever Russia sends a container, cargo and even warships to the Mediterranean Sea, they pass through Turkey. Historically speaking, this has always been a strategic choke point for the Russians. During the Cold War, the Turkish Straits significantly diminished the role of the Soviet Navy and played a critical role in the NATO strategy of containing the Soviet Union. The Russian dependency on the Turkish Straits still holds today. For example, Russia's supply lines to its forces in Syria go through the naval supply route which extends from Sevastopol in Ukraine to the naval facility in Tartus in Syria. In between lies Turkey, which in theory could use the Montreux Convention as a legal framework to conduct inspections on vessels suspected of engaging in illegal activities such as arms trade and narcotics trade.
By implementing security checks on Russian vessels, Ankara would create a new obstacle for the Russian supply lines to Syria. There are already reports of Russian ships experiencing significant delays in the passage through the Turkish Straits. Under the pretext of safety, Turkey could disrupt and delay the Russian supply lines to Tartus in Syria. But perhaps Turkey's biggest option against Russia is Article 20 of the Montreal Convention. On the condition that Turkey is a party to a conflict or faces an imminent threat, Article 20 grants Ankara the legal right to prevent the passage of enemy warships through the Turkish Straits. If Article 20 is invoked, it would simply cut Russia off from the Mediterranean Sea. This would have devastating results for Russian geopolitical interests in the Middle East. It would also severely diminish the image of Russia as a global power and at the same time significantly improve the Turkish reputation throughout the region. However, Article 20 has never been used before. But then again, Putin and Erdogan are politicians who are known for setting new standards and norms. Still, both leaders are pragmatic and understand that closing the straits or natural gas are only last resort measures. For now, however, Turkey is serious about moving ahead with its plan for a safe zone in northern Syria. The United States has already expressed a willingness to assist Turkish operations in Syria through means of a heavy airstrikes campaign. What's more is that unlike in the past, Turkey's passive and neutral stance in regards to Russia will no longer hold. We will see a Turkey that is slowly becoming more assertive and in fact will take the lead along with the United States in the NATO confrontation against Russia. The recent cancellation of a multi-billion dollar Chinese air defense system by Turkey reaffirms Turkey's commitment to NATO. In the meantime, Russia has expressed its commitment to the al-Assad government and will not back down in Syria. In fact, Russia has placed sophisticated weaponry in its naval facility in Tartus and is now seeking for ways to expand its military involvement in Syria. With so many conflicting interests and opposing players involved in Syria, the chances of future skirmishes between Russian and Turkish forces will increase. In essence, the downing of the Russian warplane marks the start of a new chapter in the relations between Turkey and Russia. The gloves are coming off. Ankara and Moscow are returning to their historical confrontations. We will see more Turkish-Russian flashpoints and disputes emerge in the Caucasus, the Balkans and the Middle East. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I just want to extend special thanks to the following patrons. Their support and that of many others have contributed in creating this report. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to support Caspian Report in creating more original content like this, please visit our Patreon page in the description. For now, thank you for watching, take care and so